Anybody ever seen that movie, 2003, Paycheck? If you like those, like, uh, figure it out as you go movies. Um, ben Affleck plays this, this reverse engineer, and he does these top secret projects, and then he has his memory wiped, so he can't remember what he did during the project. And in this particular movie, uh, what he does is, is when he's in the know, when he knows what's going on, uh, he realizes that it's going to have to survive the memory wipe, so he sends himself a bunch of junk. Uh, he makes up this brilliant plan that is going to, in Hollywood fashion, save the world, right? Um, and he sends himself all the junk that he needs for it. But when he gets to that point where he doesn't remember, he doesn't realize it, he has this obvious crisis, okay? What, what I want you to, to, to get from that movie is this idea that as, as he goes, he begins to realize that he has provided himself with everything he needs for this plan that he no longer understands for this plan to work. And he goes through this process where he begins to learn to sort of like trust that he's got what he needs and use them accordingly. In, in our final passage in Luke this morning, we're going to see as, as Jesus outlines to his disciples that, that they are a part of a giant plan that God, has been, that God has been carrying out and that God has provided for them every single thing they need. Sometimes they don't understand how, but they have what they will require. And this morning, as, as we look in Luke, I, w- I want you to recognize that, that what may seem like a lot of junk <laughs> before an unknown future is really this, that up until the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of history was according to God's plan and carried out by God's power. And since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as, as, as Jesus gave his disciples a mission to follow, all of history since that point has also been according to God's plan and by his power. And if we are also followers of Christ, that's something that we need to recognize and to live out. We're going to unpack this in two parts in Luke chapter 24. So I'd invite you uh, to open your Bible and turn to Luke 24. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, that's fine. Uh, we have a, a Bible under the chair near you. Um, every week we're in God's Word, so many of us bring our copy of God's Word. If you don't own a Bible, please take one of these under the seats. Make sure you find one that hasn't been beat up too badly. Um, and make it your own as our gift to you. If you're going to borrow one of our Bibles or use your new Bible, it will be on page 885. Otherwise, uh, you're on your own. Find Luke chapter 24. All right. We're going to begin reading in, in verse 44 of Luke chapter 24, so you can follow along. With me. Then he, that is Jesus, he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their eyes to understand the scripture, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead. And I'm going to stop in the middle of a sentence right there, okay? Because <laughs> I want you to see this. All right, we're going to look back. Jesus, Jesus if, if you were here last week, um, Dan explained how Jesus has appeared to his followers and he has proved to them that his resurrection was physical, that he wasn't just a ghost, but that he was really there. He showed them his hands and his feet. He ate some, some food in front of them so they would realize that he's not a ghost and he has proved that he is literally back from the dead. And now, today, Jesus looks and he says, you've, you've got physical proof that I'm back. Now I want to give you the, the scriptural proof. He said, all these things I've been saying to you while I, was, while I was still with you, all of these things about the Old Testament being fulfilled in me, you've got to understand them. And, and he had been talking about this his whole ministry. Like, just, just prior to that weekend, he had been crucified. And at the Last Supper, he had said he was going to give his body for these followers. He had predict, predicted his own betrayal. He had been saying all kinds of things. Uh, in, in Luke 22, he flat out says, I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. Here's his scripture. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. He has been saying things like this for years to his followers. It's hard for me to believe that we've been in Luke for over three years now, (laughs) but we have. A little over three years ago, we were in Luke chapter 4, and Jesus began his his, uh, 
official, I guess, if you will, earthly ministry by reading from the book of Isaiah. And, and as he finished reading this portion of Isaiah, verse 21 of Luke 4 says, and he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And for three years then, he's been going on and on about the whole Bible being about him. All right? Maybe you've heard people tell you that Jesus is just a nice guy or a good example or a great teacher. When he says things like this, though, you realize that that's not really an option. I mean, imagine you said, yeah, the whole Bible's about me. I mean, people would look at you like, do we need to lock you up? Or are you just such a narcissist that you think the song is about you? Or, or what? But he is indeed the son of of God. And so when he says this, when he says that the law of Moses, verse 44, when he says that the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament were about him, it's true. When he says that the prophets, that is the 21 books of the Old Testament that the Jews lumped together as the prophets that dealt with history and prophetic oracles, he said those were about me. When he says the Psalms, which, which could just refer to the book of the Psalms, or it could refer to the other category of Jewish writing, the law, the prophets, and the wisdom literature, the writings, he says this was all about me. Basically, he's saying the whole Old Testament, all these things you've already known, they were about me. They were about a Savior who was going to save literally the Jews, and an extension, the world. And so in verse 45, what he does is he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. The implication is this. They knew the Old Testament, but they didn't get how it was about him until that day. Now, I suppose I should contrast that, this, with our modern-day election cycle, okay? You and I get a little bit jaded because every time election comes around, somebody will say, I'm going to save the city, I'm going to save your state, or I'm going to save the country. We're going to give free college to everybody, and we're going to give free health care to everybody, and we're going to give free bonbons to everybody, or, or we're going to make America great again. And no matter what the message is, you know, whatever the politician says up here, what you're going to get is somewhere down here, right? It never lives up to the hype. Whether the right guy or the wrong guy, the right gal or the wrong guy, gal gets elected, it never lives up to the hype. They make these great promises, and what they deliver is less. Jesus is the opposite. If anything, when the, when the Jews read the Old Testament, they saw it as a promise of this. Like, a Messiah is going to come and save us from bad people. And what Jesus delivered was this. I'm going to save you from sin. I'm going to save you from eternity separated from God. And so Jesus is not a narcissist. He's not just another politician. He's, he's the only one who ever said, look, you didn't, you didn't even understand how big these promises were that I was making to you. Your, your vision was too small. I give you more than I promise. And, and if you were to take a preaching class at a, at a modern evangelical seminary, if you were to take a class on preaching, they would tell you that you have not preached the Bible until you have preached how the passage connects to Christ. It will say you have to find Christ in every passage. And what they are doing is they're repeating this idea here in verse 45 where Jesus opens their minds and helps them understand what the scriptures really at the deepest level means. Whether you're in the books of Moses, whether you're in the law, you're in the prophets, you're in the wisdom writings, he said it all points at Christ. And he says to them, so you know then that it had been written that I was to suffer and die. He's got three monumental acts of God at work here. He said, the first major thing that you had to understand that, that you have seen this last weekend is I suffered and I died, as Scripture foretold. He said, secondly, you must also recognize that Scripture had foretold that I would rise from the dead on the third day. I'm talking to you. I just ate the food. I let you see my hands and feet. You know I'm alive, that I rose from the dead. Check. Second major act of God. And he's going to get to the third one, which is yet to come. But before we get to that, I want to point out to you that his, his repetition of these great and monumental promises that God had fulfilled are part of the basis for him to saying, trust me for the future. You see that these things have been true, 
in the past. You've seen how God, through his power, has made all this come to pass. Now trust me for what is to come. Back in the the early centuries of the church, there was a bishop in Smyrna by the name of Polycarp. And back when Rome was persecuting Christians, he had been captured and he had been put on trial, and he was a very old man. And the proconsul there was like, I don't want to put an old man to death. And so he says to Polycarp, why don't you just recant, say that this Jesus thing is a lie, and I'll let you go. And Polycarp looks at him and he says, 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? He says, for 86 years he's been good to me. How could I not trust him now? How could I turn my back on him now? So so the proconsul says, look, I have wild animals. I will feed you to the animals if you don't recant. I don't want to do that, so just take it back. Just take the Jesus thing back, and we'll be cool. You don't have to die. And Polycarp basically, he said it a little bit more complicated, but he basically said, send for them. And the proconsul looked at him, he's like, well, if you're not scared of being torn to pieces by animals, he says, I will burn you at the stake. Just recant. And Polycarp looks at him and says, ha, you threaten the fire that burns for an hour and in a little while is quenched, for you know not of the fire of the judgment to come, the fire of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. He says, but what are you waiting for? Bring what you will. And so Polycarp is burned at the stake because he recognized that God had been faithful from day one. And he knew that whatever God did, no matter how much it may have been scary or uncertain. He knew that God would be good to the very end. He had seen God's faithfulness. And Jesus says, look, you saw me go to the cross. You saw me raise from the dead. You ought to understand that God is doing something incredible here. Okay? Let's continue reading. Actually, I'm going to read verse 46 again. So he had said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So he says we've got three major acts of God. The, The Messiah is crucified, The Messiah rises from the dead. And the third one is that repentance and forgiveness of sin will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. So he says to his disciples, look, you are witnesses of these things. You have seen them happen. You're going to be the ones who tell the world about it. And here's the deal. We also, as followers of Christ, have witnessed what God has done in our life. And we also are expected to take part in this proclamation to the nations. You, not just the pastor, not just the the guy with the big education or the smooth talker, but you, all believers. And if that scares you, that's okay. Right? If it scares you, it's just because you haven't seen the promise in all the clarity that God intended it. So look at this. He says, you are witnesses. You are going to proclaim this. But, verse 49, behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. We'll talk about that promise in a second. He says, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He said, God didn't just promise that I would die and that I would be raised again. He promised something else. He promised that this proclamation would come from something else. And it had been promised through the prophet Joel. And so we read in Joel chapter 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. He says, look, whether you're a man or a woman, a son or a daughter, whether you're old or young, whether you're free, even if you're a slave, He said, I will pour out my spirit upon you. It's so important to them that Jesus flat out tells them, stay in the city until you are clothed with his power from on high. He says, don't go spread the message yet. You don't have what it takes. What you need is my Holy Spirit. 
What you need is the power of God to accomplish what I've set before you. So he says, wait here. And then once you got the Holy Spirit, then go to all the nations. Right? I was watching on YouTube uh, a little bit. I think it was last week or the week before. I found a clip of a, of, a, of a guy by the name of John Lennox. He's an Irish mathematician. He is a professor of math at Oxford University. A brilliant man who believes in Christ and is not shy about talking about it. And so in this video, he was talking to Harvard students, and he was going to tell them a story about the, the power of God at work. And so he says, he says I, was, I was on a train in, in Europe. He had been at a mathematics conference, and he was on a train in the middle of Europe, in the middle of the night, and he, and he gets into this compartment, and there's a couple Russians there, and I, and I think a couple other people in the, the compartment with him. And, and he starts talking to this guy, uh, this Russian, because he knows Russian, apparently. So this guy was like, oh, he's surprised that he's talking to him in Russian. And they started talking uh, about how the, the things had changed since the Soviet Union had fallen. This was a number of years ago that this happened. Um, the guy was talking about these things that he can talk about. And, and, and John says, he says, I got this impression on my heart that I should give this man a Bible. I said, but here's the deal. Where do you find a Russian Bible? On a train in the middle of Europe in the middle of the night. How do you find one of those? So they're talking, and this, this man is telling him that, that he's an ecologist, and now they can have ecologists, apparently, because the Soviet Union uh, has dissolved, and now they can talk about, about God, and, we, and they can have all these discussions that they used to not be able to have. And he said, as we continued to talk, I just felt this weight grow heavier and heavier on me that I had to give this man a Bible. And he said, but then I remembered. A number of weeks prior, I had been in Italy talking to a publisher... And a publisher had on his desk a Russian Bible. He said, so I looked at the Bible and I said, well, that's a nice Russian Bible you got there. And the publisher said, well, I can't read it. Would you like it? So John said, yeah. So I took the Bible. And he said, you know, I remembered I had stuck it in my suitcase. I wonder if it's still there. So in the middle of this conversation with this Russian guy, he stands up, he reaches into his, his suitcase, and lo and behold, the Bible's still there. So he pulls it out and he hands it to the guy, and the guy's gone as white as a sheet. He's like, what's wrong? <laughs> and the Russian says, how did you know? And he says, well, what do you mean? He said, how did you know that six weeks ago, the only Bible we have ever seen in our village was stolen? How did you know? And John says to him, well, do you believe this stuff? And the guy says, I don't know, but my wife sure does. And his wife is sitting there with tears of joy just streaming down her face as he hands her this Bible, which is an incredible story. But the story doesn't end there. You see, as, as the Russian couple leaves, um, the, the German girl in the compartment looks to him and says, does this kind of stuff happen to you a lot? <laughs> And he says, well, no, not really. But imagine if, if these people have been systematically denied for years the word of God and God wanted to reveal himself to them, don't you think he could use a, a guy like me to be a postman just as well as anybody else? And the woman says, well, I better read that Bible. So he starts a correspondence with her and she begins to read God's word, which is really cool. But the story doesn't end there. You see, he goes home and he sits down with his wife and he tells her what happened and she says, give me your planner. And so he does and she starts looking through it and she says, you need to cancel everything for the next two months. And he says, are you kidding me? And she says, no, you're going to Russia. And, and he says, no, you don't get it. I can't, you can't just go to Russia. She says, well, what would you need to go to Russia? He says, well, I got all these forms that I'd have to fill out. I'd have to get all these permissions. I'd have to get it cleared through this guy and that guy and the other guy. And she says, okay, call the guy. And he says, all right, I will next week. And she said, no, now. <laughs> so he said, I do what my wife says. So he picked up the phone. And he called the guy. And the guy at the other end picks up the phone and says, wait, you want to go to Russia? He says, we want the Russian mathematicians here. And the way it works out is a week for a week trade. He says, can you go for a month? And John says, well, I can go for two months. And the guy says, done. You don't need the forms. You've got the money. You can leave tomorrow if you want. 
And so he goes to Russia and he says, I sit down with those students in Russia and the only thing that they want to hear from me is how does a man like you believe in God? Can you get the picture here? We can come up with these great and incredible plans and we can gather resources and we can put our heads together and come up with great ideas and that's not a, a bad thing, but we can do all this work and have little fruit. But when the Holy Spirit shows up, when God intervenes with little to no work whatsoever, monumental things happen. And so Jesus says to his followers, don't leave Jerusalem until you have the Holy Spirit. My friends, you and I have that same Holy Spirit within us. If you are a follower of Christ, you have the same Holy Spirit within you. You could say in a way that you are living fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel chapter 2. That you are living out Old Testament prophecy. Jesus said, look, God has created this plan that involved a, a, a savior dying and raising again. He brought it out all by his power. And now what his plan has to do with you is he is going to use you to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. And he said, but wait, because you're going to do this by God's power. And we will see this. We're going to take a break over the summer. Um, in the fall, we're going to pick up with the sequel to Luke. Uh, Luke actually wrote another book of the Bible called Acts. So we're going to uh, work our way through that starting this fall. And what we will see in the book of Acts is these tremendous growth of the church according to the power and the plan of God. We'll see the Holy Spirit rocking things out. Okay, we're not gonna, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself there because we've got three more verses that we're going to grab here and explain. So verse 50. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Okay? Now we've got a little bit of foreshortening here. We'll see in Acts chapter 1 that about 40 days happened between these two events. Luke, for the sake of time, has just stuck them together. All right? Later, Jesus is going to go out and he's going to bless these people and he's going to leave. But there, is, there are three really heavy doctrinal truths here that we cannot miss as we wrap up Luke. First of all, we got to recognize that Jesus ascends into heaven. He leaves. And no, it's not like Rocket Man where he's got boosters in his hands and feet and just shoots up into the stratosphere, right? It's not that at all. But what he gives them, because heaven is not like the city resting on the clouds or something, what he gives his disciples is this visible picture that he has departed, all right? And why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because we believe in a Trinitarian God. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if the Bible says that in Hebrews 12 that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, if Jesus meant it when he said on the cross, it is finished, if, if the Bible is true when Romans 8.34 says Jesus intercedes for us, he presents us as perfect to God, if the Bible is true when Revelation says Jesus someday will come back, then what we have to assume is that Jesus isn't here now. All right? Not the end of the world. I'll explain why. <laughs> he isn't here but he has given us instead the Holy Spirit. All right? Scripture is very clear on this. And so I say, well, why is this such a big deal? Well, it, it might help us to consider the way that we talk about Jesus. Because we have this, this huge promise that we've been given the Holy Spirit, the power of God to accomplish the will of God in our lives. And that Holy Spirit has clothed us with power from on high. Like that's the picture we get. But sometimes when we explain the gospel, rather than saying you will receive the Holy Spirit, what do we do? We cut part of the Trinity out. And we say things like, you should invite Jesus into your heart, which is certainly well-intentioned. And it certainly reflects the fact that we do find forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ, right? That's right here. But what does Jesus say we ought to be proclaiming? He says we ought to be proclaiming repentance and forgiveness of sin in the name of Jesus. Jesus. 
And what repentance means is that we have a messed up wrong idea and wrong life and we need to change that and we need to recognize what's true. If I invite Jesus into my life to help me out, what I'm saying essentially is that I'm the center of my universe and sometimes I need a little hand up and so I ask Jesus to come and do that. But if I repent, what I'm saying is, I've recognized that I am not the center of the universe. That's where Adam and Eve got it wrong, that God is the center of the universe. And I'm saying, God, I'm not going to make it my way anymore. I'm going to do what you made me for. And so I'm going to repent that I have gone my own way, and I'm going to ask for forgiveness and be brought into your own way. And then what I will receive It's not Jesus living in my heart, which is a bizarre little picture, but the Holy Spirit who indwells me and clothes me with power. And on a practical day-to-day level, if I just have a little guy living in my heart, again, I know that that's not like a legitimate real thing, so I, in my head, I just make up, I didn't know what it means, right? It means I'm forgiven, I get to go to heaven. But it strips me of this understanding of this expectation that I have the Holy Spirit in me. It's not that receiving Christ is a bad thing. It's that we've cut the Holy Spirit out of the equation entirely. And we have forgotten that Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, but wait until you have the Holy Spirit. And we forget this miraculous gift, this wonderful and beautiful thing that God has given to us to enable us to live out the life that he has laid out before us. Because Jesus is in heaven. And it was in Jesus' death and resurrection that we find forgiveness But in the here and the now, what we've been given is the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Right? And so the disciples then, and following in this idea of Trinity here, what you find is this. The disciples, in verse 51, he, he, he parts from them. He was carried up into heaven. Verse 52, they worship Jesus. They worship him, which is a huge big deal because if you're a Jew, you recognize, you've been told from the time you were an infant, there is one God and you worship no other. And if you worship any other, that is like the height of blasphemy. And yet here we have the disciples of Christ, solid, God-fearing Jews who are worshiping Jesus Christ. And what has happened is in their head, it has finally clicked They have finally understood that all this stuff that Jesus was talking about, about I and the Father are one, and if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, and all these things that Jesus had been talking about finally clicked, and they realized that he was indeed God. And so it is right for them to worship him, the second member of the Trinity. He has given us the third, right? The Holy Spirit. And if if you're not convinced that this is a big deal, you can look into the book of Acts. And you can find this account about Herod. In in Acts chapter 12, we read, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Herod didn't even claim to be God. But because he he allowed them to worship him as a God, God struck him down dead. And Jesus says, it is right for you to worship me as God. This will contrast us from various other religions. The Muslims say that Jesus was a prophet, but not the son of God. It's a very different belief, right? Jehovah's Witnesses will say that Jesus was not the son of God, which is why we would say, theology is wrong. We worship a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And related to that, again, is this last bit here. They were continually in the temple blessing God. The Jewish believers at the beginning of the church knew that they had not invented a new religion. Jesus had proved to them that all of God's revelation up until that point had really been about them. They just had a fuzzy picture of it. And so when they accepted Christ as the Messiah, they weren't saying out with the old, in with the new. They were saying, we've always had this. Now we just finally get it. Now we just finally realize that God the Father, God the Son, and the promised Holy Spirit are one. Now we get to realize what God has promised us since before the beginning of time. 
since the day that Adam sinned and God promised redemption. This is why the early church was persecuted, not as a new false religion, but as a sect of Judaism. The early persecution of the church came from the Jews who thought, you're corrupting our religion. But those who were part of what Christ had done went back into the same temple and they worshiped the same God because they knew that he and the Son were one. Okay? And what this ought to do for us is this. Remember, we saw this morning how the death and resurrection of Christ proved God's plan and his power for bringing it to fulfillment. We've seen how that ought to give us confidence to know that the next step in the whole plan, the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness, that will also be fulfilled by God's power. Right? We know that Jesus is in heaven and he has given us the Holy Spirit to provide the power that we need. And so we know that Christ and, he, and, and us is included in him are part of a plan that has been foretold since before the beginning of time, right? So how do we respond? Well, we say if you're not included with Christ, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're hearing here what God has promised, the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Scripture is clear that you repent, that you acknowledge that you have not been God's people, and you ask him to forgive your rejection of him and to bring you into a right relationship with him. And it happens because Christ died and rose again. He died in our place. He took the penalty we deserved. And so if you don't belong to Christ, that's the obvious first step. Be included in this plan. If you do belong to Christ, I would hope that this passage would encourage you to pray with great expectation that God would work in and through you. That you would say, God, I know that I have your Holy Spirit, and so I ask you to unleash your power to bring your truth into my neighborhood into my workplace, into my family? Would you make me into your image and would you use me to invite other people into your life? We can look to the future, my friends, as Christians with this this unreserved hope, knowing that the same God who rose Jesus from the dead sent his Holy Spirit to live in us. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that in the name of Jesus Christ, we find forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that he came and that he accomplished your will on earth, that he intercedes for us in heaven now. And we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to live in us, to indwell us, to give us the power that we need to live out your will to provide the power to change us and transform us into your image in a way that we are incapable of doing ourselves. And so we pray with expectation, God, knowing that you will do great things in us, in our lives, through your Holy Spirit, if we will only learn to listen to you and depend on you and follow your call. And so we ask that you would make us your witnesses of what God has done that we might proclaim your goodness and draw all men and women in this world to repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like to encourage you. um, Am I still on? Am I on? Check. (laughs) I would like to encourage you this next week. I know that we talk about the Holy Spirit um, on a fairly frequent basis here uh, at Bethel, but we don't typically spend a whole lot of time focusing on his role. And, and so I would encourage you this week to take the next step here. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul gives us a picture of the role of the Holy Spirit and his gifts within the church. And so I would encourage you to take some time this week to read 1 Corinthians 12. And as you do so, I would like you to consider this question. Do I believe that spiritual gifts, when the Bible talks about them, are just things that I'm naturally good at? Or are they gifts of supernatural power where the Holy Spirit has given them to me for the good of his church? Okay, is it just stuff that I'm good at? Or is it stuff that the Holy Spirit has empowered me for the good of the church? And as you do so, I would encourage you to pray 
that God would reveal to you what gifts he has given you for the benefit of this congregation, of this church, and of those who will be included in this church through our obedience to Christ as we proclaim repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus.